I'm a biostatistician at MD Anderson. So I'm a cancer researcher and I'm a numbers geek. And when I hear about the possibility that an intervention that costs maybe 10 bucks a year can reduce cancer incidence by a third or more, I'm really excited. And I'm also going, why the heck aren't we doing it now? And in terms of why the heck we aren't doing it now, so I actually want to take you through some of this. And in particular, I want to talk with you about what the recommendations are today, how they are set, and how we're reviewing them. The recommendations today, the US RDA for vitamin D, it's currently set by the Institute of Medicine convening a panel of experts who will review the evidence and say, well, we know that the level of requirements varies between individuals. You may be healthy with 20 nanograms per milliliter. You may need 30. So when we account for that variation in requirements across the population, we want to set a target that's high enough that most of the population will be healthy. Okay, that seems pretty reasonable. Now, what endpoint did they use? Well, they decided to focus on bone health. That's also not unreasonable. That's where we've got the most evidence. But for vitamin D, bone health is sort of the lower bar. Once you've got your bones healthy, there may be extra vitamin D to strengthen your immune system. So you may have room for benefit above that. So that's what they're using as an endpoint. With that as an endpoint, what did they set as a target? The Institute of Medicine in 2010 said that we should be targeting 20 nanograms per milliliter. About three or four months after that, the Endocrine Society, which treats a bunch of people with bone health, said, actually, the, you no, know, you're wrong. We should be targeting 30. So now we have two high-level authoritative groups arguing at a fairly basic level about what the level should be. So what do the data actually show? So here is the data that they're using to assess bone health. This was from a study that was run in Germany where what they did was they said, we're going to take bone samples from autopsy, autopsy patients. Basically, we're going to go in, we're going to extract bone marrow from the pelvis, the iliac crest, and we're going to measure the fraction of the bone that has become mineralized. Your bone is constantly turning over, forming new bone, and when it becomes mineralized, it gets hard, it gets strong. So you want the fraction that is not yet mineralized, you want that to be low. And the people running this study, when they looked at their, their stuff, they said, hey, if you get to 30 nanograms beyond that, we see essentially no problems. But the IOM said, well, no problems may be too strong. Maybe we should back up until we're allowing just a few problems. And in particular, when they went back to 20, just this next one over, they said, the number of cases that we see, well, it's only seven. You ran six, or you looked at 675 patients, seven out of 675, 1%, that's still acceptable. So they said, let's shoot for that. But there's a problem with that. To show you the problem, I want to focus on the numbers between 20 and 30. And when you look at those numbers, between 20 and 30, is the rate of soft bones, the rate of high values, is that 1% or less? It's not. What happened? Well, the problem is that the IOM, when they took seven and divided by 700, they were dividing by all of the patients that were measured and what they really needed to be dividing by was all of the patients who were above 20. The ones below that aren't relevant. So in this case, the actual rate of soft bones, it's not 1%, it's over 20%. So they divided by the wrong number. If you divide by the right number, you come up with somewhere around 28 or 30. And if you look for other evidence using serum parathyroid hormones, what this is saying is that other means of evidence say, wherever this curve gets flat, that's what we should be targeting. And guess what? The other lines of evidence also say about 28 or 30. So that's the goof part. We aimed at the wrong level. So, all right, we're still talking about serum levels. That's a target. But also to operationalize that, to get something that you can do, we have to tell you what this means in terms of intake. How much should you take per day? So to do that, we need to fit a curve that relates intake to the serum level that is achieved. So the IOM fit a dose response curve 
and they said, how wobbly is this curve? So there's that central curve and there's that band around it. And they said, using that, we'll account for that wobbliness in the curve and we'll come up with a recommendation of how much you should take as a dietary intake. They said, you should take 600 international units a day. But if you look at this plot, there's something weird. The something weird is that several of the dots here, several of the groups of people that they're looking at averages of, they're not anywhere near this curve. They're coming in and they're not reaching the required serum levels. What's going on is that while there is a variation in the population involving requirements, how much serum level you need, there's also a huge amount of variation in the population with respect to how much intake you need to get to a Viven serum level. So you need to account for both. And actually the fact that there is this big other source of variation, this was pointed out in 2014 by a group in Canada that said, actually we can account for that, but you gotta make the bands a heck of a lot wider. But you need to do this to capture most people. This was followed in 2015 by a population study from Grassroots Health where they said, we've done the measurements. Actually, you're right. You do need to measure, you do need to allow for a lot wider bands to catch most people. So they said, here's what we need to do. And there was a written conclusion that, you know what, if we don't do this, we're gonna have a lot of people with low serum levels and probably soft bones. That would be bad. So the IOM, having been criticized, felt the need to respond. So what did the IOM say? Well, we based our measurements or our predictions on requirements. You didn't. We did it right, you did it wrong. Well, sorry. The thing is, they're both relevant. You actually need to account for both of them. Accounting for one isn't the whole story. So that's not quite an adjustment. But there's something else the IOM did in making that assertion. It showed us in this plot two things. First, if you look at that curve, that solid curve where they say, we're, here's where the recommendations are, that upper limit is still at 20. They haven't adjusted for the fact that they used the wrong denominator yet. That's still a problem. The other thing is that that black solid curve, that's their estimation of the distribution of serum levels in the US and Canadian populations today. You'll know that it goes from zero up to about 40 at the upper end. We're probably too low even by their standards, let alone by the ones we're advocating. But the other thing that they're saying is that if we bump things up, we might get to this point on the right where we are worried about harm. Are there harms? What's causing them to worry about harm? Well, to worry about harm, they actually looked at some studies that thought, they would, or that also looked at relating vitamin D levels to overall mortality. And when they looked at one of these studies, what they're showing you here is the result of a few different model fits to the data where they split the data into quadrants. Here's the different serum levels. And the thing that got them really, really worried was this uptick at the right. This very small uptick and they said, that's a J shape. That means that we've gone past the point of benefit and we've gotten to the point of added risk. That's bad. But I'm gonna tell you that I'm a statistician. And when somebody shows me model fits and they look like this, my immediate question to them is, where are the error bars? How much uncertainty is there? To answer that, let's look at the raw data that gave rise to this. Here is the raw data by quadrant or quartile. What I'll tell you right now, difficult statistical analysis. That bottom curve is lower than all the others. You're right, low vitamin D is bad. Then the next one, that's lower than the other two. The last two, the highest levels, I'm sorry, the difference that if you see a difference there, that's statistical noise. We don't have the data to draw that conclusion yet. So that's something where the dread of danger is overbalancing what's actually there. Furthermore, I'm gonna point out that in this study, the initial primary endpoint of this study wasn't overall mortality. It was whether elderly people had to be put into nursing homes, whether they were no longer able to care for themselves. And if you look at nursing home enrollments, guess what? For this one, there is a separation and it says that higher levels are still better. So the dread of danger is overshadowing potential benefits. Now, there's another way of thinking about danger, which is to measure where we actually see toxicity. That's what normally happens. This is something that was done by Hathcock et al. in 2007. 
Why are the levels that we're talking about trying to get to 40 or 50? Well, guess what? That blue quadrant in the lower left, that goes up at most to 100 or so. We're smack in the middle of that blue quadrant. We don't get to anywhere where people have seen toxicity until where those red things show up. And on the y axis, on the x axis where we're talking about intake, that's a log scale. We're nowhere close to toxicity. One last point is what's optimum? The choice of choosing to target the US population, one of the things about not moving it too much is the assumption implicit there that the US distribution is close to optimal. Is that reasonable? Well, obviously we've evolved to spend most of our days indoors sitting in front of computers all day. Well, you can question that, and indeed a group in the Netherlands did, and they went out to Africa and they measured levels of vitamin D in tribesmen in Africa, and what they found in healthy men and women in these cohorts, the levels are between 40 and 60 for men and women, and they're almost half again higher for women when they're pregnant. So we're not that worried about toxicity yet. We think this is actually where we should be aiming. So bottom lines of all this stuff that I've just told you, EGAD were too low. 20s, too low for bone health, even when they said they were gonna get, go for that. That's the result of a goof. 30 is probably right for bone health, but for cancer, there's room to move up because bone health is a lower bound. We haven't seen signs of any toxicity. There were no toxicity events in Jones' trial. So as a result, guess what? The simple benefit to us looks real. The only reason we haven't been pursuing it is that we're afraid it might not be. But because it is, it's something for 10 bucks a year, yeah, we can probably reduce cancer incidents by a third. That's what I've got.